Yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thanks for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for inviting me uh, and greetings to all for this early session in Bonn. I would very much have liked to join in person, uh, but in Eichstätt the lecture started just this week and so I didn't want to miss the very first lectures, uh, week of lectures. Um, yeah, as the title says, uh, this talk is about minimax rates, whatever that is, I will explain it in a moment, for learning certain classification functions and in the end of the talk, we will actually use neural networks to say something about these minimix rates. Um, so the talk is divided into four parts. In the first part, I will first explain um, what classifiers with a regular boundary are, uh, what minimix rates are, um, and somehow what the, what the questions is uh, that I'm going to address in this talk. Uh, then in the second part, I will talk about some known results in this area, which were somehow the starting point for this project that I'm presenting here. Uh, then I will very briefly give an overview of our results. And in the last part, depending on how much time is left, I will present some proof ideas. And before I actually start, I should have said that this is all joint work with Philip Peterson from the University of Vienna. Um, okay, so let's start with the first section. Um, so this talk is about classification or about learning classification functions. And you've probably all seen slides like this uh, a lot. So the idea in classification is somehow given inputs, you want the computer to figure out the correct label. For example, in digit classification, given a handwritten digit, it should say, it should give a number telling us what digit is depicted in the image. And mathematically, this boils down to just receiving a lot of training samples and you want, want to then come up with some classifier, so a function which labels new inputs in the case of binary classification, which I will always consider just um, with labels plus or minus one. Um, and how this is mathematically modeled is you assume that there is some underlying probability distribution D, which is the joint distribution of the inputs and the labels, uh, which you do not know. Uh, so basically this tells you how probably each of the inputs are and given an input with which probability plus or minus one is the correct label. Uh, and you only receive a bunch of training samples distributed according to this distribution. And the goal is based on this training sample to somehow find a classifier HS, which has very small loss so that the probability of mislabeling a new um, input is as small as possible. Um, and there are two main approaches to do this somehow, which I'm here calling the agnostic or the model-based approach. Uh, actually, it's not to do this, but to mathematically formalize this maybe. Uh, in the agnostic approach, which is related to the so-called PEC learning, probably approximately correct learning, you don't have any prior assumptions on the probability distribution D of the data and the labels. Um, but to still be able to learn something, you then fix a hypothesis class H from which the learner will pick his learned hypothesis. So this could be a class of neural networks or a class of linear classifiers. Um, all kinds of stuff are possible. And then the goal is using this training sample, uh, you want to find some element of this hypothesis class such that the probability of misclassification for this thing that you learned is essentially the minimal misclassification error possible in the class that you're considering plus some epsilon. And in this case, the implicit assumption or hope is, of course, that some guy from your hypothesis class will actually perform well on the given task that you have. So it's not an explicit assumption on your distribution, but an implicit assumption. Uh, and there it's known that such a hypothesis class is PEC learnable, meaning that you can do some, something like this with high probability if and only if the so-called VC dimension of the hypothesis class uh, is finite. So if you didn't understand any of this, it's not so important because I'm just mainly saying this here to um, make clear the distinction to the setup that I will now be considering for the rest of the talk, which is the model-based approach. Uh, so in this PEC approach, you do not have any assumption on the underlying distribution. And in the approach that I call the model-based approach, probably other people call it differently, we do assume that we have some knowledge. Namely, we assume that the probability distribution D that we are given that we do not know is an element of some known class of a lot of different probability distributions. And for instance, you could have the following setting, which is not the setting I will be considering in the following, but just to have a very easy example to begin with. Your class of probability distributions, for example, could be the class of all distributions DF, where DF is the distribution of the tuple X, and she F of X is less or equal to one half, where X is uniform distributed. So what is this weird she? So I'm writing in this lecture always chi or she, 
to have an indicator variable which takes values in plus minus one and I write a fat one when actually we have values in zero and one. Right? So this is just a fixed notation. And uh, yeah, so you, you could have an assumption like this, which would be a model-based uh, assumption that you know that the true distribution belongs to this class, but you don't know which CK function it is that is uh, underlying the true distribution. And then the question is, how quickly will the error of misclassification when you learn in an optimal way go to zero when the number of samples goes to infinity? And of course, I mean, if your distribution class is very bad, it might even be that the error doesn't go to zero at all. But uh, the question is, does this happen? And if yes, how quickly somehow? Um, okay, and this is formalized by the so-called minimax error, um, which is defined as follows. So as, as, as buff, you consider now some class of probability distributions on some input space times R. So the samples come from X and the labels come from R. So you could either be doing a regression or classification. And with curly M, I write the set of measurable maps going from X to R. And then some of the minimix error is the best possible error that you can get in the following sense. So you minimize over all possible learning algorithms, which given M training samples produce a new classifier. And for the best learning algorithm, you take the worst distribution among the class of distributions that you're considering. Uh, you then take the expectation over drawing M training samples from this specific distribution and measure uh, then the, in my case, uh, squared L2 error according to a new training sample. So basically what this is measuring is for the best learning algorithm and the worst distribution in expectation, how quickly does the squared L2 error go to zero? And you could of course consider other losses, but in this talk, I'm always gonna focus on the squared L2 loss. Um, Okay, and the, this is the minimix error and the minimix rate then just asks how quickly does this minimix error go to zero as a function of M. And what you could, for example, is expect is to have some kind of polynomial or uh, decay like M to the minus alpha. Um, okay, and the, the, somehow the, the point of the talk is to figure out how this minimix error scales for a certain class of distributions related to classification. Um, but first, let me give an example of a minimix error where it is actually well studied, uh, namely for regression problems, it's very well known how this minimix error behaves. And there are two very different settings. So I'm always doing now regression with Sobolev or CK functions, but the first setting is the noise-free setting. So there our distribution DF, uh, where F is some unknown Sobolev function with K derivatives. Um, our distribution DF would be the distribution of the tuple X, F of X, where X is uniformly distributed in the unit cube and F, as I said, is some Sobolev function. And then it is known that if you want to do this, so if you want to optimally learn this regression problem, then the minimax rate for doing this decays like M to the minus 2K over D uh, as M goes to infinity. So again, if you have very high smoothness, this is very good. But if you have a very high input dimension, uh, you're subject to the curse of dimension. But still, if, if your smoothness is very big, uh, you get a quick decay, right? And then the noisy setting, as probably many of you know, uh, this is completely different. So here we want to learn, I mean, we want to do regression, but we have noise on the training data basically. So our input um, is again, X is uniformly distributed, but our training sample Y will now be distributed as F of X plus Delta, where Delta is some normally distributed noise, for example. And then it is known, uh, by a classical paper by Stone, for instance, that the minimix error for this decays like M to the minus 2K over 2K plus D. And what you see already now is that this exponent that you get here is always bounded by one, right? No matter how high the smoothness is. And again, you're of course uh, subject to the curse of dimension. Um, okay, so this was for regression, uh, but I, what I will consider in the following is certain classification problems where basically you don't have real valued output, but just plus minus one output. And to explain this, uh, what kind of, or in the following slide, I will explain what kind of classification functions I will consider. These are classification functions where the boundary between the two classes, which are classified as plus or minus one, have a certain regularity. And to describe this regularity, I fix some class curly B, which is some set of functions going from the D minus one dimensional unit cube to the unit interval. And this can be any subset, I mean, it should be non-empty, uh, which I will call the boundary class in the following. And what you should think of mainly is it could, for example, be CK, meaning that then the boundary between the two 
um, regions should be CK regular. Uh, and then first, let me say what the general horizon function is. So a horizon function is you take some function from this class here, so which takes D minus one inputs. And the horizon function is basically, it classifies everything under the curve as one and everything above the curve as minus one or vice versa. You can do both. And you can also pick the coordinate, um, which is basically the free coordinate and the, the other coordinates you plug into the G. So basically you could also, I mean, in, in this coordinate, we have the graph under the curve. You could basically also consider the area to the right or to the left of the curve. This would be a horizon function. And of course, I can only draw a two-dimensional picture, but in general, it's d-dimensional. Um, and then I say a set has B regular boundary or has decision boundary in this class B with M pieces if you can cover the whole set. Uh, I mean, I'm again considering minus one one valued things, but uh, the set B is where the classifier is one and outside it's minus one. So and I say the decision boundary has regularity B with M pieces if you can cover the whole set where the function is one by M disjoint or almost disjoint uh, at the boundary um, cubes such that on each cube, the indicator function of the set is actually a horizon function. And here should also have written she B and not one B, sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, and then I write CL classifiers of BM for the set of all these functions, which uh, are classifiers with boundary regularity B and M pieces. And somehow the question that I'm considering in this talk is, what is the minimax rate for learning such functions depending on the class that you put here on the boundary regularity that you have? Uh, and the second question is, are there some interesting boundary classes for which you can for this class overcome the curse of dimensionality. So only have a very mild dependence on the input dimension uh, or actually a rate which is independent of the input dimension. Um, and of course, I'm not the first to consider this kind of problem. So let me um, briefly recall some known results in this area. I will first start with some known results uh, that were prior work for myself and then also go into work by other people. Um, so one of the goals was to somehow be able to overcome the curse of dimension and one class for which it is known that you can do this for example using neural networks is the so-called barren class uh, and these are functions i mean if you look at this formula or the the, the take home message is basically a function is barren regular if the fourier transform capital f of little f is into or has finite first moment and the the size of this integral i then basically call the barren constant or the barren norm of this function and for technical reasons, I'm putting here this minus one and allow adding a constant C here, but essentially you could just think of a function as barren regular if uh, the Fourier transform has finite first moment. So and for these functions, it is known that the function itself, now I'm not uh, talking about classification at the moment, but really about approximating such a real valued function that you can do up to error some constant times square root of D over N using shallow uh, neural networks with the ReLU activation function with n neurons. So with n neurons, you basically arrive at error square root of d over n. So at least in the exponent here, n to the minus one half, the dimension does not appear anymore. And this result is originally down, uh, due to Baron, and we just proved some very slight generalization uh, regarding the activation function and showing that you can actually do it while still maintaining the weights to be bounded. Um, okay, so one thing that we will consider is then instead of taking CK boundaries, looking at uh, classifiers where the boundary of the two uh, regions plus and minus one is barren regular. And for this in an earlier paper, we had some partial results, but we were not fully satisfied with these. So what do these partial results say? Uh, the first is the approximation result. So if you have such a function uh, where the boundary is barren regular, then we showed uh, with M pieces, then we show that if you have essentially M times N neurons in a three hidden layer neural network, you can approximate the function very well in the sense that you can actually achieve it or make it such that the network is exactly equal to uh, Shai B, except on a set of measure, essentially N to the minus one half. So the two are exactly equal, the function you want to approximate this function here with a barren regular boundary and the neural network, except on a set of small measure. Uh, and based on this, um, 
approximation bound by just using an usual VC theory, we could then show also a learning bound, meaning that if you get samples from such a function, then with high probability, and if you do empirical risk minimization over some class, suitable class of neural networks, where the size of the network should depend on the number of training samples that you have, then as an output, you will again get a neural network, which is identical to the function that you want to learn, except on a set of measure this year. And the important term is that it goes down to like m to the minus one over four. Okay, so this just follows from the from the approximation result plus some elementary VC theory. Um, so you can get error. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there's a question by Moscow. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Felix, I would like to ask you, uh, what does it mean empirical risk minimization? Do you compute to the global minimizer of the empirical? So, you assume that you have your, in your hands the global minimizer. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So, I assume that you can actually solve the minimization problem. And what, what I'm actually doing, I, I didn't write this completely correctly here. I'm actually also composing the network with a signum function at the end. So basically I'm the network will spit out a real number and then I just look is it positive or negative and compare that to the output of the classifier. Yes. And so the problem is you cannot actually solve in practice this uh, this empirical risk minimization problem. Well, I, I won't say so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the sense that yes, maybe with uh, with a certain algorithms you cannot do that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so I I will get to an improved version of this result later on, which is also a bit more realistic. Uh, you you oh, will right. still not be able to guarantee to find the global minimizer, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is already quite interesting. Um, um, Felix, can I ask another question? Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so in this result, you have uh, data drawn from the uniformly from the cube. Can you, can you make a different data generating distribution in this result? Yes, yes, yes. So in this result, so in this paper that I'm citing here, we actually put more general definitions. Um, but so, so first you cannot do it for an arbitrary probability measure because just this class of barren regular boundary things has infinite VC dimension. Um, but what, what, what you need is basically that if you look at the graph of a function, and look at the delta tube around the graph of the function, then the measure of this should not be too big, basically. So, so you want to exclude that the, that the distribution is very highly concentrated on the boundary. And if you can exclude this, then you can also handle more general measures, yes. Yeah. So, but for simplicity, I'm somehow here considering only the, the uniform measure. Okay, thanks. So for example, just if you have any measure with a bounded density, that would be fine. Um, Dr. Felix, Felix, one more question to you. Uh, sorry if I interrupt you, but- No, no, no sure. Multiple interruption anyway. So the, <laughs> the question is how is so important that everything is defined on the opinion uh, space uh, in your opinion? So what I'm saying is that my feeling is that the next step would be to make uh, 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 neural networks on certain metric spaces like uh, the basis type space uh, uh, of probability measures. So the question is. How much of this would be uh, dependent on the Euclidean space or the finite dimensional situation? Yeah, so I mean, so uh, already this, this definition of the Baron class is highly dependent somehow on, on it. So um, I mean, it's a good question, but uh, I cannot say anything. I, I cannot claim at all, and it's probably just wrong that you can somehow extend these, set, uh, these results easily to, to such a general setting. Okay. Um, okay, so, so we have this bound and what we could also show um, by some reduction to a different problem is that you will not be able to get a better rate than essentially m to the minus one half minus something that goes to zero as d goes to infinity. Um, but of course there's still a gap, right? I mean, here it's saying m to the minus one over four and here it's saying even better than m to the minus one half. And so after we got these two results, we were really, asking ourselves, okay, what is really the optimal rate, right? Is it n to the minus one over four? Is it n to the minus one half? Uh, what's going on? And somehow we then figured out a way on how to solve this and this uh, presenting this is what this talk is about. Um, so just as a preliminary result or somehow some, some somehow similar result, but not for barren regular uh, sets, but for CK regular sets, this 
um, minimax rate is already known. So there are results, uh, starting with results of, with a lot of work by Tsibakov and co-authors regarding the question, how well can you learn such regular functions when the boundary is CK? Okay, so you want to learn in a classifier where the decision boundary has regularity CK and D dimensions um, from noise-free samples. And what he showed is that you cannot do better than this rate, m to the minus k over k plus d minus one. Um, so this is a lower bound that they showed. And they also present some kind of estimation algorithm, which essentially achieves this rate, maybe up to log factors, I'm not sure right now. But it somehow involved um, construction, what the actual estimator is doing, uh, which is why I'm not uh, going to go into details how this works here. For us, more the lower bound was more interesting. Um, and then also in a recent, more recent paper, Kim Oon and Kim showed that you can achieve this rate here up to a log factor if you do empirical risk minimization with respect to the hinge loss over a suitable class of ReLU neural networks. And here you, I mean, you see a bit that at least this has some chance of being numerically realizable because the hinge loss is actually a smooth function, whereas taking the, the signum function at the end completely destroys any kind of differentiability and so on. So in some of these were the results that we knew existed and we somehow thought, okay, can we do something similar for the class of barren regular functions? Um, and what we ended up doing is actually considering quite or completely general boundary regularity. Um, so just as a reminder, so for the lower bounds, I will only talk about lower bounds concerning horizon function. So a horizon function is again, everything if you want above the graph is classified as one and everything below the graph as minus one of some function. Um, and for learning this, these kinds of, this class of functions, I will now present some lower bounds. Uh, and the first is the following. So we have again, an arbitrary class B of functions which define the regularity of the, of the boundary of the function here. Um, and what I assume is that you have some good bounds on the L1 entropy numbers of this class. So what are these entropy numbers? Uh, the question is this set B, how many L1 balls of radius epsilon do you need to cover it, right? This is entropy numbers. Um, and if you have lower and upper bounds for this, up to log factors of this form, then what we can show is that the minimax error for learning these horizon functions where the function defining the boundary is some unknown function from this class B, um, this minimax error for learning these functions scales like this, uh, once you have these L1 entropy bounds. Um, and I'm, I, in the last part of the talk, I will go into a bit of details of how we showed this, uh, but this is basically the main result. Uh, okay, and this is now for very general boundaries, right? Uh, completely general boundaries, as long as they have entropy scaling like this. Uh, and now we needed to specify this to the variant class to get the results that we wanted. And so for this, we proved the following entropy number bounds for the Baron class, which as far as I know are novel. Um, so I couldn't find them in the literature. They are in the literature L2 error bounds, which appear in the thesis by Candes, uh, but neither L1 nor L infinity entropy bounds. And of course, I mean, the L2 bound, uh, the L2 entropy numbers are bigger than the L1 entropy numbers, but we need both a lower and an upper bound. Right? Um, and what we showed is that the L1 entropy number scale like epsilon to the minus one over one half plus one over D and that the L infinity entropy numbers are upper bounded by exactly the same thing times a log factor. So I should say for, 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 the, for applying the result above, you wouldn't really care about the L infinity entropy numbers. It would be enough to know something about the L1 entropy numbers. But somehow once we got this, we got so interested in the problem that we also wanted to solve the L infinity case. And in the end, we, we managed. Um, so this is the result concerning that. And then if you combine the two, you get uh, this lower bound here. And so, so, I mean, this lower bound here or this exactly the bound is just for learning the horizon functions. But of course, if you have general classification function with boundary from the class B, this is a strict superset of the class of horizon functions. So this means if you want to learn such general uh, sets which have barren regular boundary, you get this lower bound for learning them. So you will never be able to do better than this. 
And what you should note here is that this quantity here, if D is very large, scales essentially like M to the minus one over three. So it's exactly in the middle between our uh, lower bound of M to the minus one half that we had and the upper bound of M to the minus one over four that we had. Um, and then the final result that I will go into is similar to the result by Kim Oon and Kim that if you do empirical hinge loss minimization to actually learn such functions with Bern regular boundary, then you can achieve rate M to the minus one over three plus kappa where kappa is an arbitrary positive number. So at least if D is large, then this essentially gives us the minimix rate. And you could maybe be actually improve this here a bit, but we didn't try too hard. Um, okay, so these are the main results. So if, if you don't care about them, the rest of the talk is probably not too interesting for you because I will talk about the proofs. Uh, but if you somehow find these interesting, I hope you will also like the proofs. Uh, are, are there any questions right now just uh, concerning the results? Uh, Felix? Yeah. So uh, about lower and upper bounds and entropy numbers. So what would because you know this usually when you lower bound right entropy number we do it through packing numbers and then we know that there's just a factor of two in between and you know same scaling and that's so I wonder if, how would you um, end up getting uh, different exponent? I mean lower and upper bounds different exponent. What uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> the, the reason we allowed this here is because in the beginning, uh, I mean, so, so this is just if, if, if for some reason you are unable to really determine the sharp scaling of the, of the entropy bounds, then you can still apply this result somehow. And in the beginning, we had exactly this kind of problem. We were getting lower bounds for the entropy numbers and upper bounds, which didn't quite match. So it was nice to have this result here. But of course, you're right, or if, if I understood your question correctly, uh, usually you will have up to log factors exactly some kind of scaling like epsilon to the minus one over beta and then uh, both bounds will be the same. Or oh, was this your question? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's good. So, so you had a situation where you ended up here. In the beginning, yes. I mean, in the end, as you see here, it's very sharp, uh, but in the beginning, yes. And, and somehow we, we state this general result such that you can also use it mm -hmm. if you don't know exactly the, the right exponents. Thank you. Um, Okay, so the proofs, I mean, I will basically prove, go into the proofs of the three different results. First, this uh, general result concerning the minimax rate for learning these horizon functions, then regarding the entropy numbers of the Baron class. And finally, if time permits, how you can do this learning using neural networks, um, which is actually the least interesting result because we are mainly just citing a off the shelf result from somewhere else in the planet. <laughs> um, but for the first two results, we actually had to do something. So first I will talk about how you get the minimix bounds for learning these horizon functions where the Bs come from a general class. Um, and what we ended up doing is we reduced this to a density estimation problem where quite nice uh, minimix rate bounds are already known. So let me briefly explain if you don't know what density estimation is. Um, so here you take some space S and take a reference measure lambda on it. And then you consider a set of probability density functions with respect to this reference measure. I mean, you could do it more generally, but this is the setting I'm going to stick to now. Mm. And the density estimation problem asks you the following. I pick a secret element P star, a secret probability density P star from the set P, and I only give you a lot of training samples which are distributed according to this density. And then your task is based on the training sample to find an approximation PS to this density P star. Um, yes, and for this kind of problem, uh, Baron and Yang, proved nice bounds for the minimix error. So let me first tell you what the minimix error is. <laughs> it's defined as before. You basically take the best learning function, which maps a bunch of training samples to an element of this probability density class. And you then take the, I mean, then you take the worst distribution for this given learning function and see how well in expectation over the training samples does it do, does your learning function do? And as the distance between uh, probability density functions, we take here the so-called Hellinger distance, um, which is basically the L2 distance between the square root of P and the square root of Q. And we take the squared Hellinger distance. Um, and for this setting, very nice bounds have been um, derived by Yang and Baron uh, in 1999. So they showed that if all the densities you're interested in are uniformly bounded, um, then if you have entropy or bounds for the Hellinger entropy numbers of your class, 
um, where I now make quite precise, also including logarithms, everything, but essentially you have Hellinger entropy bounds like epsilon to the minus one over alpha from below and like epsilon to the minus one over beta from above, then the minimax rate for this density estimation question scales uh, like this from below and like this from above. Okay. Um, and I mean, you won't find this exact bound in the question, but if you, uh, in the paper, but if you really read the paper uh, and put a few of the results together, you will obtain this result. Um, okay, so now the question is, what is the relation between such a density estimation question and the learning of a classifier that we are actually interested in? And once you see it, it's quite obvious, but uh, somehow for us, this was uh, interesting insight. So again, we are working on the unit cube and we have a classifier over there, which gives us outputs minus one and one. So as the set for density estimation, we take now the product of the unit cube with plus minus one. And as the reference measure, we take the product of the Lebesgue measure and the uniform measure on plus minus one. And then given a, a boundary function B, you can define such a probability density function. You don't need to look at it. I will explain what it does in a moment. Um, and this gives you a connection between the problem of learning the horizon function into density estimation problem. Namely, the point is that this density here is actually, you can show that easily, the density of the distribution of this random vector here, x, where x is uniform distributed and the horizon function evaluated at x. Okay, so this guy here is the density from this. And what does this mean? This means that if you take samples for learning the horizon function, then these are exactly the same thing as samples for the density estimation problem for these kinds of densities. Um, and the second observation is that if you look at the squared Hellinger distance between two such densities for different boundary defining functions, then this is exactly the same up to this factor as the squared distance between the two horizon functions. And it's exactly the same as the L1 norm or the, the L1 norm of the difference of the two boundary defining functions. And why is this helpful? Um, this here, uh, I mean that the Hellinger distance is essentially the L1 distance. This gives us a relation between the entropy numbers of the class of all these probability density functions with respect to the Hellinger distance. These are exactly related to the entropy bounds for L1 of the class of boundary defining functions. This is the first observation. And the second observation is because the samples are the same and because we have this connection between the squared L2 distance and the squared Hellinger distance, the minimax error for learning horizon functions scales up to a constant exactly the same as the minimax error for this density estimation problem where you want to estimate some density from this class based on training samples. Um, yeah, and so basically via these observations and combining them with the result by Young and Barron, you get exactly uh, this nice general result here for computing the minimax error for learning such horizon functions. Um, okay, so this uh, I thought was quite nice and not too, not too crazy once you get the idea. Um, okay, here's again the, the exact bound with all the log factors if you want to have it, but probably you don't really maybe it's a bit too too much detail. So it's exactly the same bound as before, but before I was judging, just writing up the log factors and now I'm writing exactly the log factors, but maybe it's a bit too crazy. Um, <laughs> okay, so the second question is, how do you then actually compute the L1 entropy numbers of this Baron class? Um, and the first result is a lower bound for the entropy numbers with respect to L1. Um, so we show that the L1 entropy number scale like epsilon to the minus one over one half plus one over D. And we do this more or less by an explicit construction. So I mean, what, what you need to show here is you need to construct given small, uh, small epsilon, a large number of functions in the Barrow class, which each have pairwise dis L1 distance at, at least epsilon, right? Um, so what we do is you pick your, you pick your favorite bump function supported in the unit cube, um, and then given n and n, you scale it to make it supported on a cube of side lengths one over n. And what you then can consider is for a given subset of all possible cubes with side lengths one over n that fit into the unit cube, 
you take the sum over all shifted versions of these scaled versions of phi, so they will be supported in some subset looking like this. Um, and one can then show, it's not quite trivial, but one can do it, that if you scale this weird sum here by n to the minus one plus d over two, then this will actually belong to the Baron class once the constant c is big enough. And okay, you can do, put a small factor in front if your c is not large enough. Um, okay, and then using some bounds from the theory of error correcting codes, maybe you could also do it easily, more easily. We show that you can actually choose a lot or large set of such subsets of the unit cube, such that whenever you take two different subsets of these, they have a large, I mean, the, 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 the symmetric difference has a lot of elements, namely up to a constant factor, up to this factor 16, the symmetric difference has as many elements as these cubes, as the total number of these cubes that there are. Right? Um, and once you do this, and if you concentrate a bit, you can see that this gives you the uh, desired result. But uh, I think going into more details isn't really feasible right now. So you, 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 the, the main idea is to somehow construct these different functions here, considering uh, associated to each subset omega of all these cubes. And then by results from theory of error corrected codes, you can choose many such subsets such that the symmetric difference of these, of any two of these subsets is large, which then ensures that the L1 distance between these guys or between these scaled guys is actually large enough. Um, okay, so then we had this lower bound and we were also able to do some upper bounds for the L1 entropy numbers. But for some reason, I wasn't satisfied with getting L1 and was, was thinking a lot about how to get L infinity bounds and couldn't do it until I stumbled upon a very nice paper by DeVore and Temlyakov, uh, which I, I, I didn't know it. And so maybe it's uh, good to make a bit uh, a small advertisement for it. Um, so this is just to recall how the Baron class looks like. So you basically take functions where the Fourier transform has one finite moment. And what we then showed is that the, you know, the, the G shouldn't be here, that the um, L infinity entropy bounds of this class of Baron functions is upper bounded by exactly this term times log factor. And what I should say, a similar bound for the L2 entropy appeared in this PhD thesis of Candace, but L2 is somewhat easier because this is a Fourier-based definition, so it naturally is related to good L2 control, whereas getting L infinity control was more subtle. Um, Okay, so how this works is what we show at first is that if you give me some Baron function on the unit cube, then I can ex actually expand it into a Fourier series where the coefficients are summable, even weighted with this weight. And just one small detail that you should note, the Fourier basis on the unit cube is actually e to the two pi i n dot, right? And I have to take e to the two pi i n over two dot because if you would have n dot, then the functions were actually all periodic, right? But the functions from the Baron class need not be periodic on the unit cube. And by somehow, so these are an orthonormal basis for like a slightly enlarged cube so that you can actually then approximate functions which are not periodic, even uniform. Um, okay, so this was not too, is not too difficult to get uh, using some standard techniques from Garber analysis and, and, and related fields. Uh, but then we, 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 had, we hit the roadblock of somehow, okay, we know now that F can be expressed as such a nice Fourier series with very nicely decaying coefficients, but we couldn't deduce from that that you can approximate in L infinity the function well using a truncated Fourier series. Uh, and it's also not true, I think, that if you just truncate to the first terms or to the largest terms that this works, uh, but a very nice paper by Devon and Temlyakov, they showed actually that you can get nonlinear approximation bounds for such Fourier series. Um, and by invoking these results, what you get is that you can approximate such a function by G, where G is a linear combination of only epsilon to the minus one over one half plus one over D terms, and you can then get L infinity approximation error at most epsilon. Okay, and what does this now tell you? This tells you that each function from the Baron class, you can somehow well approximate using such a trigonometric sum, which doesn't have too many terms. And then you can really sit down and discretize these sums and so on to really explicitly more or less construct a suitable epsilon net for this Baron class. 
Uh, but the main the main ingredients are really showing that you have this Fourier series and then searching for a few months until you by accident stumble upon this paper by Devon Timyakov, which gives you the infinity approximation. Um, okay, so with this, you get the L1 and L infinity uh, entropy bounds, which you can then use to plug them into the result for the for the optimal rates. Um, yeah, so the last part of the talk is related to learning bounds uh, for learning these functions using neural networks. Um, and this is basically based on applying a known very general result from Kim, Ohn, and Kim, with, which is concerned with um, telling you if you do empirical risk minimization with respect to the so-called hinge loss, which I will discuss now, then you get quite nice learning bounds. So the hinge loss is this function here, which is zero once you get above uh, one and below it's uh, linear. And what is the point of this? The point of this is if you have some function h, which takes values in minus one and one and some other function f, then if h and f have the same sign and f is large enough, then the loss will actually be zero. But if they have differing sign, then the loss will be quite large, at least if f does have a different sign and also large magnitude. Um, okay, and then using, using this hinge loss, you can define the true hinge loss of a hypothesis f with respect to a ground truth h. Uh, and you can also define the empirical hinge loss where you just compare or ask, has, does f have the same sign basically with large magnitude as the training sample yi? Um, and then what Kim Ohn and Kim showed, it's quite a technical result. So I want to draw your attention just to two points, <laughs> three points maybe. So they say, okay, we have some ground truth function H that we want to learn. We know it exists, but we don't know what it actually is. So what we are going to do is we will do empirical risk minimization over a class FM, which is the class that we will use for M training samples basically. And you need to know two things and some other technical stuff. The first thing you need to know is that this class FM is so rich that you can actually choose a function little FM from this class FM, which gives you small true hinge loss. So this is an approximation result that you need to have. And the second result, uh, the second thing you need to know have is you need to have control over the L infinity entropy numbers of this class FM over which you will do empirical risk minimization. And if you have these two things, then you get a learning bound telling you that if you do empirical hinge loss minimization over this class, then at least an expectation, the loss, or I mean the, 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 the probability or the measure of the set where your learned classifier does something incorrect can be bounded by the maximum of these sequences AM and delta M. And again, it's all very technical, but the main things is you have to have this class FM where you have control over the L infinity entropy bounds and where you have this approximation result. And once you have this, you get some learning bound. Of course, sitting down and determining what exactly the learning bound that you get is, is not completely trivial, but uh, I mean, you just need to sit down for half an hour and do it. Um, Okay, now if you plug this result in and combine it with our existing results, then you get the nice learning bound. So our existing result showed that if you have such a classification function with barren regular boundary, then using a certain class of networks with three hidden layers and O of M N neurons, you can approximate it up to error into the minus one half, essentially. I mean, the two are exactly equal, except on a set of measure into the minus one half. So this is the approximation result which ensures that you can meet this condition here. Um, and the second result is just that if you have such a class of neural networks, it's well known because we know that the weights are also bounded, how the L infinity entropy numbers of this class of neural networks scale. And then by invoking this result and combining it with this approximation result, you get the following result. If you do empirical hinge loss minimization over a certain class of neural networks, I'm also telling you here how the number of neurons and weights of the network scales as the number of training samples goes to infinity, then you get exactly this um, error bound. Uh, 
yeah, so this is basically the final result. Um, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.